constantly hearing, well, of course, that one was easy. He was just a piece of cake. It wouldn't work on one that wanted to resist you at all. And they just scoff at me and put me down. Now's my chance. We have a wild one. This is not going to be easy. A lot of people have been killed trying to break Mustangs. I think he's absolutely crazy and runs a risk of being killed. Really, honestly. Chances of success, not very good. The risk are uh, internal injuries, broken bones. You see a lot of cowboys without teeth. Some of it had to do with that. Son of a gun, gonna have big He's going out with the wild ones. That's wild, right. wild. Yeah, they broke wild horses before. Maybe not his method. Not his method, that's my but point. But they've broken. For tonight, I'm gonna see you. Gonna you gonna do it? You wanna go with him? Well, I... <laughs> well, uh, well, now, see, you don't... <laughs> my, I don't either. My insurance company don't cover me. <laughs> so I, see how that is. I'm out. There. If you've ever been around a horse, you know the most dangerous part of the horse is his front feet, not his back feet. His back feet hurt you. The front feet kill you. The front feet in this case belong to a wild Mustang. A man called Monty Roberts plans to take such a dangerous and untamed horse and persuade it to be saddled and ridden simply by talking to it. They are wild. They are wild to a degree that they would be very dangerous when you're up close, but they would never want to be up close. So getting up close to them is very difficult to do. Mustangs are wild horses that escaped from the Spanish centuries ago to roam over the western states of America. Although small in build, they're fast, very dangerous, and can easily kill a man. Yet these are the horses that Monty hopes to talk into tameness. Your obligation, then, is to break this barrier. Monty Roberts is renowned throughout the horse world for his remarkable ability to persuade an unbroken horse to accept a saddle and rider in less than 30 minutes, a process that normally takes weeks. Outside Two years ago, QED showed how Monty does it. Perhaps because it is so amazing to watch and seems so easy, some think Monty must be cheating by using partially tamed horses. So to prove them wrong, he's decided to put himself on the line. His method will face the ultimate test as Monty tries this on a Mustang in the wild. However, many are convinced that this time he'll fail. There's a very happy horse. It is going to happen. How do I know that? The horse has told me. For 50 years, they've been telling me. I wasn't in the horse business till I was three. I was showing horses in competition before the age of reason. My father used me as basically a calling card to his riding school. If this four-year-old, then five, six, and seven-year-old could just whip all the competition up to, say, 16 years of age, um, you ought to go to that school, you know? All right, talent set to go. Prescott, here's where it all began. Help him. Monty grew up in the Western riding tradition and, as a young man, started to compete in rodeos. Oh. I won masses of championships in, in rodeo. I won the national championship in 1957. I wasn't a particularly talented rodeo competitor. I worked like heck at it and uh, got good enough to win. I enjoyed it, though. Showing my horses and rodeoing was my life for about 22 years or so. In those days, part of that Western tradition was the way a horse was broken. The technique was often harsh and horrified Monty when he watched it as a boy. If you tie a hind leg up on a horse and you put him on a pulley high on a post and every time he jumps or fights to resist whatever you're doing with him, you pull his head right up high. It supposedly causes him to be so uncomfortable when he does that that he quits. And, and in, as a matter of fact, he does quit. 
Um, I watched my father breaking horses uh, in what I consider to be a most abusive way. And they would come gentle. Um, and ultimately, they would do their job. Again, my opinion is they didn't do their job as well as they would have done it if they did it because they wanted to, not because they're forced to. It is wild horse racing time on our side. Wild horse races are the ultimate invasion of uh, a wild creature. These animals are gathered uh, in the wild, trapped. They're trucked to an event. If someone could just start to look at it from the eyes of the horse and realize the terror that must come over them, to be treated in that fashion is just, it's just dead wrong. I grew up watching this event. I competed in this event. Mile, mile. Very bold. You have lined them up with horses. As soon as I got to know the wild horse, I hated every minute of it. It's wrong. Monty first really got to know wild horses when he was 14. He had gone out to Nevada to trap them for a wild horse race. And as he stalked them, he learned something surprising about their behavior. My first discovery was that the black stallion didn't lead the family group. I always thought the stallion in the movies, you know, when I was a child, he was in charge of everything. Well, stallions aren't in charge of much of anything. They're in charge of getting the mares pregnant, and they're in charge of protecting their harem from being taken away by other stallions. End of story. What I saw was that it's the mare. It's the female, generally an older female. She's the one who makes the rules. She's the one who says where we'll eat today, the direction we'll travel, where we'll drink, when we'll drink. She will babysit with multiples of youngsters and be a role model for those youngsters, telling them what was acceptable, what wasn't, and scolding them when they were wrong. And I discovered that the scolding process was to isolate. Now, what is this? Send that little guy out there and leave him out there on his own. And he knew. Somehow he knew he's supposed to stay out there. Being isolated from the herd is a sentence of death. The predators will come along and see an isolated grazer. Within 48 to 72 hours, they will die. Their herd instincts are incredibly strong. They have power in numbers. And if several mares are kicking at a mountain lion, they can do him a lot of harm. And remember that a mountain lion with his teeth kicked in is a dead mountain lion. So he doesn't want to be hurt. He wants the easiest prey he can find. An isolated grazer is like smorgasbord. The dominant mare, when she sent the colt out there, she would be communicating with him that he's to stay out there. And I saw how she communicated. Eyes on eyes, square shoulders. It kept him out there for maybe two hours. And when she felt he'd paid enough of a price for whatever action he had done negative, she would walk in a circle and she'd start to make her motions round and sort of drop her head like this and look away. And he'd start to come back in. And he would slip back into the group. Well, it was a revelation to me. Then I'd go home and start fiddling about with it with my horses. And I was, wow, it's right, you know. Even my body, not built like the horse, would cause this reaction and response uh, to the language. Monty calls this horse language equus. He uses it when he tames a horse to take a saddle and a rider. It's the key to his success. This horse is used to wearing a head collar but has not been broken in. What Monty is going to do now is imitate the behavior of a dominant mare. He's got a few little battle scars on him Monty's technique has been studied by animal behaviorist Dr. Robert Miller. Monty wants this horse to see him as a surrogate herd leader. For example, in his round pen techniques, takes a, a line and frightens the horse by throwing it out. That's a frightening visual stimulus. The horse moves and, and he keeps it moving. And he keeps the horse moving until 
Uh, the horse has gone its biological flight distance roughly a quarter of a mile. Basically, it's just a little bit farther than a lion is capable of charging. Eyes on eyes, all my motions square. It runs that distance and then turns around to see what it was that frightened it. You run first, then analyze what it was. This is typical equine behavior. And then the horse will start to signal with body language, lowering the head, licking the lips, and chewing. It starts to signal, I'm in big trouble. I've run the necessary distance. That thing is still chasing me. I'm afraid I'm going to die. I need help. I need a leader. And the only game in town is the man in the center of the pen. If he drops his head down near the soil, it means that if we could have a meeting, I'd let you be the chairman of the meeting. If he licks and chews, it means I'm a herbivore. There's the head down. So that means I'll let you be the chairman of the meeting. When the horse signals a sufficient level of submissiveness, Monty suddenly becomes passive and non-threatening. Attempt to draw him. I'm going to tell you when the licking and chewing. He turns away, lowers his gaze. He immediately becomes passive. To cause him to understand that I've moved from aggressive to passive. Good licking and chewing. This horse then comes to him and in effect asks, would you help me? Are you my leader? I need help. And he then, without threatening the horse, very quietly strokes the horse. Round movements instead of square movements. Reward him now for coming to me. And the horse, you'll see, gratefully moves his head, licks his lips, and says, well, thank you. I'm so glad. Then he has what he calls join-up. In an effort to accomplish follow-up. Follow-up. Perfect. Good licking and chewing. Then, as he moves around, the horse does the horse thing. He follows the leader. And the more he follows him, the more comfortable he is. Horses seek comfort. I want to go down here where the dogs... Monty's radically different methods are very impressive. However, years ago, when Monty as a boy first told his father of his ideas, he got a very strange reaction. My father was uh, extremely upset. I mean, he didn't want me trying anything except what he told me to try. And so what he saw was a horse that came to me, stood with me, and accepted its first saddle with nothing on its head. It just stayed there because it wanted to, and he couldn't handle it. I mean, if that was right, and it would work, it destroyed his life. All the things that he had done before that were wrong, and he couldn't handle it. And when I looked up at him, he had his mouth open and his first words were, what the hell am I raising? And I didn't expect that. I was such an idealistic child that I thought uh, I was doing a good thing. And uh, he took a piece of chain and beat me till I was in the hospital. Oh, sure, I resented him for it. If someone is uh, grossly unfair to you and physically abusive to you, you ought to resent it. I don't, I don't hate my father. I don't hate any of the... If it wasn't for my father's really tough handling of horses, I probably never would have been dedicated enough to do what I'm doing. So in a way, he did me a great favor by swinging the pendulum so far toward pain and restraint that he caused me to have to find a better way.